Well, hey there, everybody. How are we doing? And a fine and dandy good evening to you on this Wednesday before Halloween. Uh, I'm John Barba from Takeo Comfort Solutions. And uh, one of the people you know that you see on the screen here is uh, Dave Holdorf, who's in his own little Halloween costume. Uh, as am I, if you can't tell, and it'll become clear in a little bit. And uh, the, the third person we have here is is not Rick Mayo in a stunningly brilliant ha Halloween costume. That's not Rick Mayo. That is Cheryl Merchant, the CEO of Takeo. So we have we have the boss with us tonight on, on Takeo After Dark, which is kind of cool. And also joining us, we have John Messenbrink and Tim Ward from, uh, from, from Mechanical Hub. Say hi, everybody. Hello. I, I think Oktoberfest is going strong in the Warden Messenbrink households. And Cheryl's got her mask on with the with the those are what are those? Those are little ghosts. Ghosts and goblins. Ghosts and oh, ghosts. Ghosts and goblins. It's, I, I, it's Perfect. because yes. it's Halloween. Yes, it's Halloween. Thing. Come on, it's all I got. It's a Halloween thing. There we go. Well. <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody, and and thanks for being with us again on this Wednesday night. And uh, we've got we're going to be talking about that age-old um, question, which is better: zone valves or circulators? And tonight we are going to give you the ultimate solution and the ultimate answer to that ultimate question. Um, we also have you also guys have the opportunity, and this is something I want to I want to make sure that 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 you you take advantage of this opportunity because. Very rarely do you really get the opportunity to ask questions of the CEO of, a, of one of the companies whose products you use. No questions. And, Cheryl, and Cheryl's no graciously, questions. no questions, right? You didn't tell Cheryl's me questions. Gracious. Say again? You didn't tell me questions. Oh, well, um, questions surprise. <laughs> I'm just here to say hi. Okay. Well, so you could say, if you, if you have any questions, I'm sure. Um, in my next job, I'll be able to help you out because I'm going to, get, I'm going to lose this one. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but Cheryl's here to join us, and we, we're super super psyched to have her have her part of as part of the festivities. Um, we do have a theme tonight. It, it doesn't look it, but we do in fact have a theme, and the theme is because it's Halloween. It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown, which explains my yellow T-shirt because that's what Charlie Brown wore a yellow a yellow shirt. He wore that all the time. So again, tonight's cast of characters. Um, Charlie, well, Charlie Brown's not wearing his yellow T-shirt. There, he has his. Uh, he, he had trouble with his scissors for his ghost costume, and he got a rock. So there's me, and there's Dave, who is Linus, who was riding the great pumpkin, uh, waiting for his arrival. Ordinarily, we would have Rick Mayo, and we were going to make Rick Snoopy tonight because just look at that. Does that not say Rick Mayo to you? <laughs> right when you see that little guy smiling and dancing, that's a to me that just looks like Rick Mayo. But we don't have Rick Mayo tonight, so we have Cheryl. And uh, again, Dave suggested we make Cheryl Lucy. I just didn't, I, I just, it, it didn't work for me because um, I couldn't find any pictures that didn't make her look, you know, very nasty and crabby. And that's that's not you, Cheryl. <laughs> Am I saving my job? <laughs> yes, doing good. Doing good. Very yeah. good. Pull it out after you're throwing me out there for. All questions, yeah. There we go. So we, we can breathe easier now. So let's get to work tonight, shall we? And again, folks, uh, just so we all know, I want to make sure you guys know how to make this thing work. Uh, boy, a lot of you have already signed in and 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 mentioned and, and have chimed in. So good. So you guys know to find on the control panel, that little orange arrow, make sure it's pointing to the, if it's pointing to the left, click on it. It'll expand your window. The chat section down below, that's going to be where you ask your questions. So make sure that you... Uh, uh, if you haven't already, just chime in and say, hi, hello, how are you? A lot of you have done so already. And again, we're psyched to have you. We are psyched to have you. And let us continue. All righty. Now, again, I told you tonight's topic is going to be one that's very near and dear to everybody's heart. It's circulators or zone valves. Uh, and let's do a quick survey for all of you guys out there. I got about 85 of you on the line. And just type in your preference. If you were, if you were king or queen of the hydronics world and everyone had to do what you say, all right. So I'm giving you I'm giving you um, CEO level power here. Everybody has to do what you say. All right. How would the world, the hydronics world, zone their systems? Would they zone with zone valves or would they zone with circulators? And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to accept. It depends on the application. 
make a stand, one or the other. You got to decide one way or the other. All right. So I'm let's see what we got. Day. We got a couple. I'm zone valves. Say what? I'm zone valves all Say day. Say again, Dave? You're zone valves all day? All day. Yep. All day. Okay. We got a lot of zone valve guys. A couple of circulator folks. Uh, zone valves, they use less electricity. Circulators, okay. Uh, most residential houses, zone valves. So zone valves are zone valves seem to be taking the day here, which is interesting because it didn't used to be that way. I can remember years and years ago when I actually, you know, worked for a living and was out in a van uh, with the tools. Um, in that, uh, I can remember going to a wholesaler, and there were there were a bunch of vans right at the front door, like normal, and then there were a bunch of vans in the parking lot with guys out there looking at their watches and looking at doors and, and looking at the door and getting kind of aggravated. Right. And, and I went in because I didn't know what the heck was going on. I went in and I talked to the guy at the counter and I said, hey, Dennis, why are these guys waiting out there for? And he said, oh, you haven't been in in a while, have you? I said, no. The, those are the zone valve guys. Those are the guys that like the zone with zone valves. These are the guys in here are the guys that like the zone with circulators. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? What the hell are you doing? And he said, well, we had a fist fight here last year. We had a brawl. Dave, one of your, one of your things is making all kinds of noise here. Yep. There we go. Just, just muted you. Um, it, there was a big fist fight here. Uh, a, a guy who, uh, one guy lost, he lost a job to a guy who was zoning with zone valves. It was a big boiler replacement job. And the guy was madder than hell because that guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's just putting cheap stuff in and he's ruining the industry. And some other guy who was a zone valve guy kind of chimed in and said something bright like, oh, yeah. And then they started arguing and then they had a brawl and there was like a six or seven person brawl. So they had to split them up. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the guys who zoned with zone valves got to go in first and get their supplies for the day. Then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the zone valve guys would go first and the circulator guys would have to wait. And then the next week they switched it, it which is insane, but it's a, it's a, it's a true story. Uh, how that, 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 that kind of hostility has kind of mitigated itself over the years. I think largely thank to, thanks to radiant floor heating. Because how do you zone radiant floor heating? Well, you zone radiant floor heating with manifold actuators, which are essentially zone valves. So zone valves guys kind of zone valve guys got some validation. Circulator guys learned that zone valves are not really the um, the, the work of Satan, if you will. <laughs> but it's still a pretty heated debate, and folks still still go back and forth on that. So here it is. We're going to give it to you straight. Absolutely, which one is better? Which one is better? Circulators or zone valves? Take your pick, all right? I don't care which one you choose, you're right. There's no functional difference between the two people, no functional difference at all when they're designed and installed properly. There's not a person within the sound of my voice on the World Wide Web that could walk into a house in the middle of winter, just stand there in the, in the hallway and say with any level of certainty, yup, that feels like zone valve heat to me, all right? You're gonna deliver the BTUs either way with no problem. So we have to understand that both ways are the right way. It, it, there's, there's no right or wrong way. It's just a matter of, of what's your preference. And, and just as long as you understand, there are certain challenges that you have to deal with in, in, in either case. All right. There, there are the people like the zone, like zone with zone valves, do it for a specific reason. People who like the zone with circulators, as long as there's a, spe a specific reason, that's fine. So we have to accept that. We have to accept that there's really no difference. And if we accept, and I realize that answer to that question is kind of like Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown, all right? But if we accept that there's no difference, then we have to ask ourselves, why do we do things like this? All right? I've been looking at this picture in presentations that I've been giving for about 10 years now, and I still to this day cannot come up with a rationale as to why this installer thought this was the right idea. I, I, I don't get it. There had to have been a reason, but I, I can't for the life of me imagine what it might be. And, and, and the other thing is I would hate to be, and in re all reality, I could not possibly be the guy that has to replace that pump. All right. Couldn't do it. Physically couldn't do it. Not going to fit in there. What you need is a skinny, wiry person with a circus background, I think, is the person that's going to have to replace that circulator. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is something like this. Now, we look at this lot. Like, wow, oh my God, that's good, sexy work right there. I mean, it's clean, it's plumb, it's straight, it's, 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 you, you look at that and you go, oh yeah, man, that's what I'm talking about. And 
this is awesome stuff. It's something I could never do. But I would suggest that, you know, we like this stuff. Those of us who are in the business, we like this stuff because we understand how hard that is to do and how much work and how much skill went into it. You got to you got to understand your average homeowner looks at that and just gets scared to death. You know, they look at that and then they look at you and they say, I hope to hell you never die. Because if you <laughs> die, what happens to this? I don't know. You know, you this, this is going to go to you with your grave. This looks very complicated. It looks very, very expensive. And it looks like they're going to have to, you know, fixing it. Any, any kind of major service is going to cost an arm and a leg and a small child. All right. It's, this is just crazy. It's it's it looks great, but it's probably overkill. And why, the reason I say it's probably overkill. Oh, let me go back here. It's going to be down here is we've got one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then over here, seven different water temperatures. We have seven different water temperatures on one job. I've done a lot of radiant in my life, and I'm I'm very I, I have a very hard time figuring out why I would need seven different water temperatures. Usually it's one per installation method and we'll call it good. This seems to be, you know, like cutting butter with a chainsaw, if you will. It's a little bit overkill. Um, I'm sure it works and works fantastic, but it look, you got to understand how it's going to look to the homeowner and 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 really is it technic is it technically over controlled? Right. So then if you have any different thoughts on that, please chime in. But that's that's the way it always has always appeared to me. Now, just just so you don't think we're picking on circulators, zone valves have their challenges as well. Now I look at this and I just kind of shake my head, but you know what? It probably worked. Okay. It probably worked, especially with this high-tech European pipe support system over here on the left hand side. So these are just some of the things you see out there. Now, I, you know, the, the, uh, I mean, I, I've never actually counted up these zones. It's got to be close to 20 zones here. And it seems like it was thrown together in kind of a rat's nest sort of thing. But again, does this make sense? Is there, is, are there better ways to do this? Are there better ways to make this work? Um, I think in every case, it, there would be yes. All righty. So let's discuss the differences, the fundamental differences between the two. Okay. Um, we have zoning with circulators and we have zoning with zone valves. So why zone with circulators? Well, I think the obvious question, answer to that is why not? All right, why not? Circulators are pretty doggone reliable and you have that redundancy. People who like to zone with circulators like to, uh, they, they like to tell you that, hey, if I've got four circulators and one of them goes down, how many circulators do I have left? Hmm? That would be three. If I only have one circulator and a bunch of zone valves and one circulator goes down, I don't have any circulators, I don't have any heat, I got a, I got a, I got a no heat problem. I get that. that, that's perfectly reasonable. That is perfectly reasonable. But, but understand this, circulators are pretty doggone reliable, first and foremost. Circulators are pretty doggone reliable. And I think the other end of that is, there, there is a dirty little secret behind all of this. And it's the unsaid thing. If every zone has its own circulator, you really don't have to worry about undersizing a circulator simply because neither we nor anybody else in the circulator business makes a circulator that you would likely you are likely to use that would be too small for most any zoning purpose that you're likely to encounter in North American hydronics. It's just impossible to undersize. Impossible to undersize. And we went through that. We went through that uh, that exercise last week in terms of sizing a circulator. And you saw how a 20,000 BTU zone, which is still a pretty big zone, all right, with it that was about 135 foot long, wound up at two gallons a minute at two feet ahead. We don't make a circulator. We don't make a circulator that's small enough to be undersized. Okay. So now the trick is to get one that's not too oversized. All right. So, so that's kind of why we zone, why you might want to zone with circulators, why you might want to zone with circulators. Now, why would you want to zone with zone valves? Again, another good question and a great answer is why not? Why not zone with zone valves? Zone valves are pretty doggone reliable, especially these guys, which Dave will show you in a little bit. Um, they're pretty doggone reliable. The wiring and the maintenance is a lot easier. It's 24 volt volt wiring instead of line voltage, low voltage versus line voltage. Maintenance is a heck of a lot easier with these zone sentries. You simply pop the head off, which takes about 
maybe two seconds if you take your time, okay? So it's easy to swap out a motor. You don't have to drain systems. You don't need isolation planes. You don't need any of that stuff. It's very easy to do. So your wiring and your maintenance is a heck of a lot simpler. And it takes up a lot less space. And let's face it, we are not we, we don't get that wing of the basement anymore to put in our hydronic system, do we? Uh, we more often than not, we're tasked with putting 10 pounds of hydronic you-know-what into a five-pound closet. So space is at a premium. And zone valves will take, one circulator and five zone valves will take up a lot less space than five circulators. That's just, that's, that's, that's just do the math. I mean, measure them, okay? Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way we would go there. Um, and somebody pointed out here earlier is circulator, uh, zone valves simply use less energy. They use less electricity, okay? You've got a, you've, you've got a, a, a you know, a, a zone century zone valve that's about 1.4 watts compared to, let's say, just a standard efficiency 007 circulator, which is 80 watts, all right? 80 watts, 1.4, there's a difference, okay? There's a difference. So if you are concerned about lowest overall energy consumption, then zone valves do have to be part of the equation, okay? They, they do have to be part of the discussion. So those are some of the rationales for zone valves. Now again, there's that issue of redundancy, right? If you don't you, you don't have redundancy with your circulators. If the circulator fails, there's no heat. Absolutely. That's a that's that's a legitimate that, that to me is a legitimate concern that that everybody should be cognizant of when you when you're doing a job. So I always th I said th let's think about this for a minute. First off, we know circulators are pretty darn reliable. Um, you know, we've, uh, Dave, you Dave, you were out on a job not too long ago where you where where you found a Perfecta, an old Taco Perfecta, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, up in uh, Rhode Island, there were two of them still running. And the Perfecta was we sold we last sold the Perfecta when? <laughs> oh, it's got to be early seventies. Uh, the yeah. double seven uh, production was, was I think started in seventy one. So we probably had both of them for a little while. So I'm not, I don't know the exact dates on that, but yeah, into the seventies for Perfectus. Yeah. So there's, there's a very good chance that that circulator is almost 50 years old. All right. They're pretty doggone reliable. They are pretty doggone reliable. And, uh, you know, yeah, you if you are committed to lowest overall energy consumption, you do have those decisions to make. Uh, I guess the, the, the best advice I could give uh, is that, you know, talk to your homeowner. And what do they, what, what are their concerns? If you have a, a, you know, folks who, you know, who are kind of maybe living outside of your, your direct service area and it's kind of a hike to get to them, all right, maybe they would be more comfortable with that redundancy. Um, if you've got someone who is more concerned, you know, they, they have a Prius and all this and, they, you know, they, they, they're very concerned about carbon footprints and things, maybe they would be more interested in, in discussing in, in, in a system with zone valves. Right. That's more of a consumer, uh, uh, something that a consumer would be would would want. That's where their input comes into play. And what do they want in terms of 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 that redundancy and and safety or energy and overall energy efficiency? And Cheryl, as a, as a as a consumer, I would I would be interested in your in your feelings on that. If you go too deep in, into the which one is which, we're, we're going to have a big problem with this whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm at a house down in Newport, and the first thing that I've learned to do is open up the furnace room and love seeing those green those green boxes in there. And uh, and then how does it feel in the house, and how is it going, and and do I have problems, and all that kind of stuff, you know. But um, the the uh, gents that I'm calling when I when I reach out. When they say that they're going to help me out with takeout, I'm all good. And then they find out who I am, and then then we have a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> That's always good. That's always good. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm down here. The first thing uh, I'm down in Newport, and the first thing when I open up the uh, the furnace, this this um, it's all takeout, and I love it. I love it. And this house feels so comfortable. You can the way the air circulates, my air how it everything happens, feels good. It's a beautiful thing. So, so that is my official definition of a freak. A when you freak. go into a, a a freak, so we when you walk into somebody's house for the first time, and if nobody can find you, or the first thing you do, you take in mental notes of how the house is heated and cooled. And yes. you're looking at the furnace room. <laughs> oh yeah, and if nobody can find you, that's where you are. 
<laughs> and you're taking pictures. And you're taking yeah, pictures. And sending it to the rest of the team saying, tell me what this is, because this feels really good here. You know, everything's comfortable in every room I go into. So what's happening? Yep. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still in learn mode. So that's it's not fair. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm hanging out with you guys. Well, there you go. I signed up for your lessons, John, and, and this COVID stuff has made it a little crazy. But this is uh, this is how you how you find out what, what's best. You guys know. Very good. I, I, I've always had that, you know, when most of the, uh, the conversations I've ever had with people about zone valves or circulators, again, you talk to most to most uh, most consumers, they 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 don't know. You know, like I said, they it's, it's no idea. Yeah, I just turned the thermostat. I don't you know beyond that, I don't care. All right. Yeah. So yeah. you know, maybe it's you know, then then maybe it's a, again it's a decision that the contractor makes in. Again, different things to keep in mind. I think different things. You know, to keep we in call mind. the homeowner. I think calls experts. You know, we, you know, whether it's whatever the, the situation, we call the experts, and we want them to know, and we want it. You know, when it they come in and they they help us out, and things break down, and, and we have to call you back, and we have to call you back. That's when we start getting angry. That's when we start wondering what's going on, and and do you know what's you know? So, and then I start coming in knocking on office doors and saying i need some help somebody's got to tell me what's <laughs> happening because i have my heart i haven't i've been out of hot water for five days so you know what i gotta do <laughs> that was a great great uh comment from douglas speck jr if we go to a wedding and my wife can't find me she looks for the church's boiler room <laughs> yep yep absolutely that's because we're unusual people, unusual people that way <laughs> yeah you know that's where we are because we care because we care all right that's, know what's it. Going on. that's it that's our that's our that's our uh that's our passion now the, I, i'm sure a lot of you guys have seen these these are this is the the Taco 571 zone valve we've been selling this zone valve in one form or another since the late 50s it's just a it's been a a, a rock solid industry standard um we still sell an awful lot of these things uh, to this day even though we have the zone sentry what I want to do is just give you some info on this, because if you if you're if you run into one of these things out in the field, I want you to just to know what it's all about and how to deal with it. It's a three. It's often called a three wire thermos or zone valve, but it's really a three terminal uh, zone valves. Terminals one and two are for the heat motor inside here, and then the end switch uh, circuit shares terminal two with the heat motor and then it uses terminal three so terminals two and three are for the end switch terminals one and two are for the heat motor so they share terminal two is there any crosstalk yeah a little but not enough to make any difference all right so it's it, it works and works very well as four wires three terminals three terminals it's, i'm going to get into the inner workings a little bit just so you know how it works with three terminals and how many you can put, how many of these you can put on 140 VA transformer. All right. So here we have our circuits. You can see this is your thermostat. That's your switch. Here's your 24 volt transformer. That's the power supply. And then you have terminals one and two for the heat motor. All right. So you just follow the red line. Okay. You go from here to the heat motor. Then you go down through this little doohickey here, which we'll discuss later, and then back. Okay. There's your there's your, your heat motor circuit, okay? There's your heat motor circuit. So the way it works is when there's a call for heat, okay, we complete the circuit and we start heating up this uh, expandable waxy element. You start running current through that copper wire, it gets warm, right? And it expands, it expands that waxy element. As it expands that waxy element, what it's gonna do is it's gonna push down this piston. Okay, it pushes that piston and valve stem down against this seal down at the bottom, which is held closed with a spring, right? So it's a very slow acting zone valve. It pushes that seal down to the point where we get flow. And it takes about 45 seconds under ideal conditions for that valve to fully open so we can get, so we can get appropriate flow. We get flow once the end switch makes. So it's 45 seconds for the valve to open and the end switch to make. All right. Now, um, the way that works is the end switch. Let me let me blow that up. It's right here. Okay, I'll move it over here. You see this this 
this little cam right here on the piston and right next to it is this actuator tab there's a little tab right there when the zone valve is closed this tab is pushing against this little button right here that's holding the end switch open as you see now as the piston goes down this tab will release the button and it'll it'll allow the end switch to close and now we've closed the secondary circuit that goes to the boiler control, the circulator relay or whatever. So that is a switch in a second circuit that will also have further down the line its own power supply and its own load, all right? Let me know if that makes sense, but that's kind of how it works, all right? That's how it works. So it's a very slow acting valve and the end switch is connected to this cam right there. Now, the tail of the tape of the 571 it's a three, the, the three, it's the three quarter inch sweat model has a CV of 6.1. That means at a flow rate of 6.1 gallons per minute through that valve, that valve will impart one PSI worth of pressure drop or 2.31 feet of head, extra head that the circulator is going to have to deal with. Typically with three quarter inch pipe, as we learned a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about two to four GPM. So it's going to be less than one PSI. In terms of equivalent length, if we were going to give this an equivalent length of pipe, we would say that that zone valve is worth about 20 feet of pipe. All right, same pressure drop as 20 feet of straight copper pipe would be a fair assessment of the zone of the pressure drop through that zone valve. Now, when we look at the zone center, you're going to see a very different story. High amp draw, very high amp draw, 0.9 amps at 24 volts. 0.9 amps at 24 volts which if you do your math, that's 21.6 volt amps or 21.6 watts. So it's a high power consumer, high energy consumer relative to the zone century, 21.6 VA. So back now, when, it, uh, when it was developed, you know, we, we've been doing the 571, five, you know, the heat motor style zone valves from the 60s. So you might look at that and think it's a really high VA uh, uh, zone valve. Well, when you compare it to the circulators that everybody was doing back then, it was still a heck of a lot lower. So this is one of the, you know, early zone valves that were out there for people. So it might seem high, uh, but at the time, it really wasn't. Yeah, everything is relative. Now, here's a head scratcher. You can put a maximum of three of these on a 40 VA transformer. Hmm, that doesn't sound right, does it? There's a little mathematical wizardry going on there, isn't there? 21.6 VA worth of consumption, and I've put three of them on a 40 VA transformer? That doesn't make any sense. I can do arithmetic, and arithmetic does not add up here. So let's think about this. I've got 0.9 amps times 24 volts. That's 21.6 VA. If I multiply that by three, that's 64.8 VA. You try to get 64.8 VA out of a 40 VA transformer, what's going to happen? Well, kaboom, that's what's going to happen. You're going to blow the transformer, right? You're going to blow the transformer. It shouldn't it shouldn't work. It should, you should know really quickly that you're going to you're going to fry the transformer and the smoke's going to come out and it's not going to work. So you should know that pretty quickly. But it does work. And here's why. We have double safety factors built in. Okay? The biggest safety factor is this valve. Is that 24 20 uh, 21.4 VA is not constant. Okay, 24 point, whatever it was, <laughs> 21.4 VA is not constant. What happens is this valve oscillates. That's where this thing comes into play right here. Okay, as you can see, this is a, this is a heater switch with a switch lifter. And if you, you see that this, the, the switch lifter is also on this little cam right here. And as the piston goes down, you can see that the switch lifter is going to get kind of pulled out or pushed out. And we're going to break this contact, which is a normally closed contact. We're going to break this contact. So we're, 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 we're oscillating the valve and we're getting intermittent uh, uh, power draw. So that heater switch will open and close uh, because of that switch lifter and it'll break the circuit to the element in the heater. So we're, our, our, our draw is intermittent. So that element's going to expand and contract. That piston's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. Oscillates at a very, very small level, not enough to change flow or anything like that. But it's just making that power draw, that amp draw, very intermittent. 
so it allows us to play that shell game with the amps with the uh, with the with the with the the transformer all right the other let me see before we go here the, the, on the other side of it there's another safety factor and that has to do with the transformer itself it has what's called impedance protection if you happen to draw more than a 40 va transformer if you happen to draw more than 40 va for short periods of time uh, what happens is the the voltage goes down all right the first thing that happens is the voltage goes down that's the internal protection that the that the uh, the transformer has that has a net effect of slowing down the valve action even more so we've had guys that say oh, yeah 45 seconds you're optimistic those things take two three four minutes to open yeah when you first start them up and you're trying to open all of them at the same time on one 40 va transformer i think it absolutely would take three or four minutes maybe longer for that valve to fully open because the amp draw is intermittent and we're going into impedance protection and we're lowering the we're lowering the voltage anyway slowing down the valves so three of these valves you can do on a 40 va transformer with both safety factors in play you're fine no problems at all wouldn't go with four would not do four on a 40 va transformer all right any questions or dave any comments or anything to add on that yeah uh well carl had posted out there he said once they open the draw stops but it's not actually stopping it's just got that oscillation takes a little takes it away takes a little takes it away even when they get to the full open that's happening when it gets there so it's always just taking a little bit and then turns it off again so that's why you're not going to uh, uh blow that transformer out and the transformer again is protecting it too at the same time so yes turn on all three go out to the truck make a sandwich have lunch come back then they'll be open <laughs> right. you yeah. so don't 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 turn them all on at the same time so um a question comes in from russell says how would you add four don't use a 40 va transformer use a right. 70 you know go yeah, bigger yeah. transformer yeah yeah that's the only way you could do it. you have to upsize your transformer absolutely yep. yeah, absolutely so that's why when you look at some of the uh the zvc controls our zvc 403 has a 40 va transformer once we go bigger then we jump to 80 we put two 40s in there because if you end up putting in the larger uh, draw zone valves, you still have enough power in the zone panel to control that. Very good. All right, it's time for our Takeo trivia question of the night. And um, again, in for 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 Snoopy, who's in absentia, um, doesn't he? Doesn't that remind you of Rick? <laughs> doesn't it? It just reminds me of Rick. Almost not quite as much as the Lorax. I'm going to take the fifth. <laughs> here's, here's our trivia question, all right? In, uh, Char Snoopy had a rich imagination. I mean, for a beagle, he had a very, very rich imagination. And in the Halloween episode, in, in, it, it's in, in The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, uh, he was, uh, for Halloween, Snoopy was a famous World War I flying ace and he was out searching for the Red Baron. And as you can see by, the, by this, the Red Baron got him, all right? The question is, and this is for Charlie, ba Charlie Brown freaks, and type your answer in, in in the question section. The question is, what kind of plane did Snoopy fly? What kind of plane did Snoopy fly? Hmm, what kind of a, do we, do we know what we have for a prize pack yet there for this, uh, for this one, Dave? Uh, tonight, uh, I got the Bluetooth speakers. Uh, I, yes, uh, some nice little Takeo speakers to, to use on job sites, you know, and it's, it has a little cord on it too. So this way you can tie it on the end of the bag so you don't end up losing it too. Um, so that and, uh, and obviously t shirts and, and whatnot. I got a pile of them I need to get rid of. So, so yes, I got a bunch of answers coming in. Wow, a lot of people know the answer immediately. I can tell this because they did not. <laughs> google it that quickly you could not have googled it that quickly that's right very good i, I can see yeah. some of them too yep very good i yes, had no good. idea i had to look forward in the powerpoint in order to find the answer myself <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember uh, here's a here's a secondary trivia question who what's what was the name of the group that did the song snoopy versus the red baron I don't think there's a prize involved with that one i just it's one of my favorite songs you know i wanted that as my wedding song my wife said no um so we had to go with something a little more romantic 
So yeah, anybody funny. knows that one, that'd be a good one too. <laughs> All righty, what kind of plane did Snoopy fly? There were two we answers for the song, I guess. The Royal Guardsman? The Royal Guardsman, that's right. The Royal Guardsman. The second one came in as Paul Revere and the Raiders. So No, uh, they might have done a version of it, but the Royal Guardsman made it, made it a hit. A few more people putting in Royal Guardsman. Michael, Nathan, Carl. Yep. Yep. Yep, that was that was definitely the Royal Guardsman. And they did like a series of those too, of Snoopy versus their they did a Christmas version. It was great. All righty then. All right, let's get back to work there, pumpkins. Now let's talk about the zone century zone valve. And Dave, do you have the I'm gonna turn it over to you in a bit here to to kind of do that little that demo uh on the zone century. But the zone century is um you know, we had the zone valve out now, motorized zone valve. We've had that. I can never remember the dates, Dave. You, you're better, better at this. How okay. how long have we had this, this zone valve out? This is at least 10 years since I'm here eight already. So I know it was out before I came on board. So All it's right. about 10 years old. It started gaining a little traction uh, just before I came on board. And the, the thing has been an absolute grand slam home run it's just in terms of it just being a rock solid, deadly reliable uh, zone valve with a lot of great features that 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 people have shown that they've really appreciated. Uh, one feature is this: it's uh, whereas the the 571 was the highest power draw zone valve on the market. Here we go the other direction. This is the lowest power draw zone valve on the market today, 1.44 watts, and you can put up to 12 of these on a 40 VA transformer. 12 of them on a 40 VA transformer. Now the math might be a little hinky there, but we'll explain how that works in a minute. Right, they're very quick open, very quick close. Once the zone valve is powered up, it that takes a few seconds if they've been off for a while. Once they're powered up, it's a quick open and quick close. And in fact, it's a power open, power closed zone valve. So it powers itself open and it powers itself closed because this body right here is a ball valve. It's a ball valve. So you have to power it open and then you power it closed. The good news is you don't have to keep power on it, full power on it to keep it open. Because once the ball valve is open, it's open until you close it, right? So it's power open, power closed. And here's the kicker. It's power open, power closed, but we're able to pull that off with just two power wires, okay? We don't, usually you need three for a power open, power closed valve. This one, you only need two. You only need two. So you wire it up like any four wire zone valve. It's the exact same thing, but it's power open, power close, all right? And in addition, you can visually see if it's open or closed. This little green dial on the top is, is a manual opening and closing. You can use that to manually open and close it, but you can also, just by looking at it, tell if the zone valve is open or closed based on the position of the dial. So it's one of those things you can, you know, if you look at some of the, some of the synchronous motor types, you look at it, you can't tell whether it's open or closed just by looking at it. This, you can this you can. Now, how does this how does this thing work? Well, a couple things. The way it's power open, power closed has to do with um, the there's an onboard um, capacitor inside the motor. It's an onboard capacitor. And what does a capacitor do? Well, it stores energy. That's why if the thing's been off, off for a while and you power it up like with, with, a, with a call for heat, you'll see a, a green light on the back end of this thing flashing, 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 flashing. And it's going to keep flashing until that capacitor is fully powered up. When it's fully powered up, the green light turns solid green and we power the valve open. All right. What's happening now that the, the ball valve is open, we don't have to keep power on it to keep it open. So it runs very cool. But what we're doing is the, the power draw at that point is now intermittent. It's poof, poof. If it, had a, if it, if it was on a gauge, the, gauge, the power draw gauge would be like poof, poof, poof just like that. And what's happening is we're topping off, we're basically topping off that capacitor, making sure it stays charged up, making sure it stays charged up so that when the call for heat is over and we kill power to the zone valve, all right, the zone valve knows to use the stored energy in the capacitor to power the motor closed. So that way we can power it open, power it closed with just two power wires instead of three. It's a neat little trick. Well, why is that of a benefit to you? Well, let's think about you know, different types of zone valves. Uh, most common is the synchronous motor type of zone valve that almost everybody uses. And that's got a little flapper or a little flapper inside. 
that it's power open and then spring return. Power open, spring return. Let me ask you right now, how what fails first? Just type in your answer and if it, 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 it should be spring because you can almost set your watch by, the, the reason they call them springs is because they fail in the spring, right? They, that's You can almost set your watch by, you know that's what's gonna happen. You like that one, Dave? I just thought of that right here. <laughs> um, but you have to keep the you have to keep full power, full power on that valve to hold that flapper open throughout the duration of the call for heat. Then again, when the call for heat is 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 done, the springs pull that thing back. They close the valve. Now, again, that's just it just more power consumption first and foremost, number one. That's why those things get hot, okay? There's more power consumption, number one, and then the spring is a service item that you know you're gonna have to deal with. You just know you're gonna have to deal with it. We take both of those things away. These things run very, very cool, very, very low power, and we take away the spring return service issue. The other thing about the ball valve itself, um, let me go back, back uh, here real quick. You see right here, there's A, B, that's in the casting and it doesn't mean anything. This is a ball valve, so you can, there's no, there's no backwards here. You can install it in either direction, all right? There's no direction of flow with this valve. So you can, there's no, you can't install it backwards. You can't install it backwards. And to, to remove the head for, for installation or for service, you simply depress that little metal bar there and lift. It takes literally two, sec two seconds if you waste time, okay? That's, that's pretty much how, how, how quick and how easy it is. And then your wiring terminals are removable little blocks back there that you can take. If if you have one that's wired up and you have to replace the head for some reason, you just pull out those plugs, pop the new head on, and then just plug the plug the old plug them back into the new head. So good. some interesting interesting ish interesting things here, uh, uh, you know, features about this zone valve that make it that make it just kind of user friendly. We we have guys that have used them and they just they're features you don't know which feature is going to click with somebody. We've had guys like the, the 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 how easy it is to manually open. You don't have to you know you know put a dent in your finger by trying to pull that lever over. They like the fact that you can't install it backwards. They like how easy the 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 thing is to to replace. They like the fact they can put 12 on a 40 VA transform and be done with it. You you never know which one of these is gonna is gonna cool. impact somebody, but those are all features uh, to that to that valve. All righty. So the only the only complaint that I've experienced over this over the years, um, and it was more the initial version, and still can be that they're hard to manual open. Like you get them in, installed in the first time on the job site, and you don't have your wiring up, and you want to purge the system out, so you want to start purging it out. And you know, what do you know about ball valves when they're brand new? They're hard they're to open, hard to move, hard to move, right? You got to break the seal, right? You're putting a little pipe on it and, and cracking them open, so. Same thing, this is a ball valve. It's gonna take a little while to get that thing, so to speak, loosened up. And people have gone ahead and just grabbed a pair of channel locks on here to try to turn it because you know we get big sausage fingers on here and you just can't get your hands on there well. Well, don't do that for one. Easier, easier way. You take this out of the box, we all know what's the first thing you're going to do before you install it. You take the top off. Install the valve, whether you go with the threaded version, the sweat, the press version, you take the power head off. This is what I want you to do first. You go ahead and go to take this thing off. Just raise it past the locking posts that we have here. This is your D stem. That's the valve stem. These locking posts grab it onto the power head. So when you lift it off past there, use the power head to twist the valve body, the valve on the inside there. So you can see on the inside, there we are closed. And I'm just going to open it up with the power head itself. So this way, you break that seal. It'll be much easier to control that later on manually. Um, or just hook it up to a controller. There's more than enough juice in the motor itself to actually open it too. So, but if you didn't have power, go that way instead. Right. And if you if you notice a little, there's some of the I think these have a little slot in that green dial. 
uh, don't put a screwdriver in there. That's not meant for a screwdriver. What you want to do is use your fingers and grab the dial and turn it like a t for those of us old enough to remember what it was like you're changing the channel on the television. I'm sure most of you in there have no idea what I'm talking about for the, you youngsters out there. But for folks of our age, we remember getting up and turning the TV channel manually. Uh, the good old days, right? And how many channels? It's a good thing we only had three channels, too. <laughs> All righty. And uh, there's a built in clutch here as well, which. I want to have Dave show you uh, uh, in, a, in a little bit because I want to go go to full we let you go to full screen on the webcams, and uh, you'll be able to get a really good idea of this how that clutch works in the real world and how it can help save you a, a potential pain in the neck a little callback that again it's going to cost you some money. Uh, we're going to wrap up with just a show you a quick zone valve layout and a little wiring scheme using one of our controls. All right. So here's your, this is a basic layout. We're looking at a cast iron boiler, okay, in this example. Whoops, a cast iron boiler, one circulator, three zone valves, okay. On the supply here, you can see we're pumping away from the point of no pressure change, like we discussed last week. And this is just a simple one zone, or three zones, one circulator. So here's our, here's a, um, uh, uh, our standard, our standard ZVC control, our standard ZVC control. Down at the bottom, you see terminals one, two, and three for the zone valves. All right. In this case, it's a four zone control, but we, we're using it for three zones in this in, in this application. And you've got one, two, three, four going to one, two, three, four on the zone valves. All right. Uh, zone uh, terminals one and two are power. Terminals three and four are end switch. So you'll know which goes where. Then up at the top, you have your three heating zones for your three thermostats, obviously. And over here, we have a, a zone four priority switch, and you would use that if we had domestic hot water priority. And we'll look at that in a little bit. All right, we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, right here, we have an isolated end switch. And then down here, we have two more end switches connected to a, a line voltage relay. So these are these are line voltage down here. This is low voltage up here. So we have a pump end switch, so we can actually control the circulator, the zone valve circulator with this control. And then if we were to have a, a, a zone four, our final zone, for to have a circulator on there with domestic hot water priority, we could use that terminal as well. We're not gonna use it in this example, but we will use it in the next one. So here's how we'd wire this up. Isolated end switch, XX, that goes to TT on the boiler to turn the boiler on. To uh, operate my system circulator, I bring uh, you know hot and neutral from uh, from from the outside. My hot and neutral comes from the power supply. I bring hot to one terminal of the pump end switch. The other terminal of the end switch goes to the circulator, and then the other wire in the circulator goes to neutral. All right. So what will happen when any zone, any of the four zones, and we only have three zones on this control, but when any zone when any of the thermostats or whatever we have on zone on the thermostat terminals of zones one, two, three, or four, whenever any of those close, this closes. All right. Whenever any of those things close, that pump end switch closes and it'll turn on that circulator. All right. So the way that'll work, there's a thermostat calls for heat. We will open the zone valve. When the end switch on the zone valve makes, okay, then both and then I'll, I'll I'll backtrack a little bit. Then both this and this switch, both of those switches will close. So at that point, the circulator will come on and the boiler will fire once that zone valve is fully open and the end switch on the zone valve makes. So that's that's real simple and straightforward how the zone valve control works. Now, if we wanted to use if we wanted to use this with a ModCon boiler, all right, we've got the ModCon. We've got the boiler circulator, which is going to be connected to the boiler control itself. We've got our system circulator, and we have our three, our three zone valves. Again, it's going to be kind of the same. Now we could we do this a couple of ways. We could have the boiler circulator connected to the boiler control, or we could have the boiler circulator connected to this control if we wanted to. It's an option that you have. Again, isolated end switch goes to your your the TT on the boiler. This you bring hot to the pump end switch, and then neutral to the circulator on the and the other end of this other end of the end switch of the circulator. So when the end when the zone valve opens, the end switch on the zone valve closes. 
this will close as well, this will close as well. Now, what about the boiler circulator? Well, this time we're gonna make use of that zone four end switch, but you'll notice we have common, normally open and normally closed. That's what's called a single pole, double throw switch. Normally closed is gonna be closed all the time, right? Normally closed is closed all the time. So what you could do if you wanted to, you could wire that boiler circulator to the normally closed terminal. So this is normally closed anyway, but if this is open when there's no call for heat, there's nothing, there's nothing here, right? So this circulator is not gonna do anything. The end switch on the zone valve closes, this end switch closes, this end switch closes, and now you'll see both circulators kick on immediately, all right? And lastly, let's show this with using a circulator for, a, for an indirect. Now we're gonna make use of that domestic hot water priority switch, all right? So here's how we're gonna make this work. Um, again, isolated end switch that goes to TT on the boiler, but to, now with, with domestic hot water priority, on zone four, we're going to have the aquastat for the indirect to tell that to tell to tell the control we have a call for domestic hot water. <clears throat> so that's going to be wired into zone four. I at this point I have my system circulator and my domestic hot water circulator, but I want this to be in an either or situation. It has to be running in an either or situation. So either the system work circulator is on or the domestic hot water circulator is on. So it never both at the same time, but it's still either or. Now again, I'm gonna have every I'm, I'm gonna have my thermostats and zone valves on zones one, two, and three. On zone four, I have the aquastat for my indirect. And what I'm gonna do on uh, terminals three and four, and I'll show you this in a picture in a minute. On terminals three and four, I'm just gonna put a jumper on terminals three and four to simulate an end switch so that when that aquastat calls for domestic hot water, it's not looking for a zone valve that isn't there to close. It's just gonna put, it's gonna think there's one there. Once that happens, everything else is gonna close. Yeah, you need so, both of those things to happen first. You need you need a thermostat call and you need an end switch call uh, to, to make. So right. just putting a jumper across the end switch doesn't mean the pump's gonna run or zone valve's gonna open up or anything like that. You gotta have both of those things to work. So that's why you can do that jumper on there just to, so to speak, trick it. Right, there you go. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do the same thing we did before is from the other side of the pump end switch, we're gonna go to common, all right? But now instead of wiring up the, what we're gonna use both the normally closed and normally closed open contacts. The normally closed is gonna be the system circulator. So when zones one, two, and th or three call, the heating zones call, this switch is gonna close, this switch is already closed, my system circulator will then come on. All right. When zone four, the indirect calls, when I get a call for domestic hot water and I want to go into domestic hot water priority, I want this circulator to stop and I want this, the DHW circulator to go. So what I'm going to do is wire the DHW circulator into the normally open terminal. All right. So when zones one, two and three are calling, pump and switch closed. Zone four pump end switch is closed in the normally closed position. Everybody's happy. When zone four, and, th and this circulator's running, 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 right? When zone four calls, we want to eliminate the calls for heat. So bam, the switch goes click, all right? It's, it's, like, it's a, the single pull, double throw. It's an either or switch. It just goes from the normally, what was closed will now be open, and what was open will now be closed. So now this third circulator stops and this circulator runs <clears throat> until we've satisfied the call for domestic hot water. And again, isolated end switch, that closes whenever any of the zones close. So All that's right. how you can use that control. That's how you can use that control to, to run three, three heating zones, an indirect for domestic hot water and two circulators now, with, one, we with one zone valve control. Stop and think about that for a second. You know, you you change. It might have been changed midstream, or uh, maybe this this house was different than the last house, as in they had a higher indirect demand, and you wanted to have that own circulator on there. But you try to buy everything the same, and you're at the job site, and you only have the ZVC control. This is going to save you from having to get a separate SR panel. 
So some people would rather just put pumps on relay panels and zone valves on zone valve controllers and call it a day and you're done. And that would work also. This is just the second option you have out there uh, for wiring. It might, might seem complicated, but we put those terminals in there for these applications just like that. So it's, it's just something a little different to take a look at there. Very good. A couple quick questions from Carlton Pember asks, can you put zone valves on the return? Absolutely. You absolutely can. Uh, personally, I like having them on the supply with the circulator and that, uh, let me go back to that picture. Um, I like having them on the supply with the circulator here. There it is. So all my moving parts are right here. Uh, anything I have to, anything I would have to service, all right, anything I would have to service, it's all on one side of the, of, of the system. And we can even go down to here. Anything that needs to be serviced is right here. And in a lot of cases, you can act, I, I know a lot of people that will actually um, pre-build or build that in their shop and, and send it out on a piece of plywood to the job site. It's all on one side. Then it's one. It's kind of like one unit. But yeah, in 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 the bigger picture, you absolutely can put it on. Put the the zone valves on the return side. Absolutely. A um, couple things. A couple more things about the the, the zone sentry that I do want to add. One is the CV rating. The CV rating of that valve is 10.3 for the three quarter inch valve. Remember, we said it was 6.1 for the three quarter inch uh, uh, 571. This is 10.3. What that means. 10.3 gallons per minute through that valve. That valve imparts one PSI worth of pressure drop or 2.31 feet ahead. Again, three quarter inch pipe, we're running at most four gallons a minute. That thing's got a CV at 10.3. It's like it's not even there, okay? It's like it's barely a speed bump on the, on the pathway of the water. So in terms of pressure drop, it is negligible to, to really non-existent. Yeah. Uh, so- You're I, I think your goal when you're putting in zone valves, when you're looking for a zone valve, you're trying to make great systems here. You want something that has the highest CV, which means it's going to have the lowest pressure drop. So right. look for zone valves out there that have high CVs. Um, as John was saying, you know, we put ball valves in systems. Why? High CV, right? Nobody's using gate valves, globe valves, things like that anymore because those had low CVs. So you want, you know, we put ball valves in for that isolation. It doesn't affect your system. The, the, the zone sentry, ball valve, low pressure drop in there, high CV, you know, so just make that uh, considerations when you're looking at your your uh, zone valve choices. Very good, very good. And uh, with the, with the, another thing about the zone sentry zone valves is we do have uh, different varieties. We have normally open and normally closed, all right? And we have um, line voltage and low voltage, and we have we have them in two-way and three-way. Um, so, you know, so there's a lot of different configurations on this valve that you're in geothermal, yep, geothermal design yep. and also domestic hot water design too. So if you needed a, a potable rated, uh, valve body, we have that also. So a lot of different applications for these things. Yeah, and the basis of this is also used in our, in our, um, our, our water heater, um, leak breaker valve to, 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 uh, stop a water heater leak so um yeah it's it's a it's a multi-purpose valve we use it for all kinds of different things and it's again proven to be really really reliable uh in the 10 years that we've been selling it so dave what i'd like to do now if you have your you have your zone sentry uh display up and ready i do all righty well here's what i'm going to do i'm going to stop sharing my screen all right and then you should just see our uh, nope, we're still seeing your screen. You're still seeing my screen, huh? We do. Yes, we do. But I do want to say uh, real quick. All right, there you go. There you go. Uh, nope, now your screen's back up again. Well, your I know the, the you're still. Let's see here. Um, I do want to say thank you for Cheryl for for stopping in here tonight and hanging out with us evening. I know she's got another appointment at eight o'clock. Um, so uh, thanks for coming hanging out with us tonight. Lots of fun to have you here. Uh, take over for Rickster since he is not in. I think you are muted, Cheryl. Nope, you're good. No, I'm off, okay. mute. I'm off yeah. mute. Yes, I got two little kids, and uh, so it's it's becoming the end of the hour with this hybrid stuff that's going on. It's kind of crazy, but I had to stop in and see you guys. You, I, I have to tell you that, you know, um, 
the bottom of the end, when you're talking to somebody like me, I call somebody like you. And that's what I said. that little thingamabob turned that way. And now it won't work. And it, you know, that hooch majiggy that goes underneath. That's where I talk. You guys are talking Greek. I am so, so thrilled to be part of a team that has the expertise that is talking to these guys out there. Um, and they, you know, they know that they can pick up a phone. We're here. And I love that. All right. So anyway, you know where to find me. If there's anything I can ever do. Excellent. Good hang out for a little while. All right. You guys have a great night. Take care. Happy Thank Halloween. You. Stay Thank out you. of trouble. Be safe. Use your mask. Yes. <laughs> or don't go out. Yes. <laughs> or something I don't want to be right here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pile of them. There you go. All right. Thank well, you. Dave, why don't you take over here? And um, if you guys want to, if you can, on your screens, maximize Dave and minimize me, um, which I think everybody wants to do anyway. <laughs> oh, um, and we do have uh, the Lorax with us tonight in spirit. In spirit. The Lorax yes. is here in spirit. There you go. Let me get that camera so it focuses on the board there for you. So a very simple setup that we have set up here. Um, I've got our uh, 0018 over here. Uh, right now, I, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to make sure it's running on a high speed, just so you know what's going on. We're flowing around this way. We've got some flow meters and some balancing valves in here. Um, and that's just so I can put some load on it, throwing our zone valves in here uh, back into the system itself. So, um, so what John was talking about with that clutch, what he was talking about, it, uh, you know, when you want to manually override a valve, you can, uh, you can manually close it, you can manually open it. Right now, these are open. I'm going to close one of them. So, and it's instantly closing uh, quickly. So, as you can see, I got my thermostat sitting up here, and <clears throat> there we go. So. You need to manually close this valve rather than running up the stairs and going to shut down the thermostat. Uh, you could just walk up to it, close the valve. And I'm sure we've all done this at one point or another. And if you haven't done it, it's either your second day on the job or you're lying. That after you manually closed it, you went home and forgot to open it back up again. And vice versa with a valve that is was off, you manually opened it up. And all you have to do is push that knob in and turn it. So right now, this one's manually closed. This one's manually opened. You know, the manually open valve, you know, happens a little bit more often. And the homeowners call you up and say, hey, it's getting really hot in here. And that's because that valve in the stuck open position. The other one is calling for heat, but we're still getting heat out to this zone here. Well, rather than jump in the car and take a drive, what you tell the homeowner, what they've been doing is hitting the thermostat right now. And the thermostat's reading like 50 degrees you know, as their set point. They think the further you get away from the actual temperature, the faster it's going to get colder, but never going to change. What you want them to do is turn the thermostat up, turn it up higher till it makes it call for heat. So I'm going to make that thermostat call for heat over here on the end. And what's going, and you tell them to leave it on for five minutes, because if you tell them anything shorter, they're not going to count correctly anyway. Leave it on for five minutes. And what you just heard was the clutch re-engaging so the clutch just re-engaged in here and said, okay, now if I were to turn it off, the valve is going to close. So that's built into that zone valve and vice versa over here that when you manually closed, they're getting cold in the house. What you want them to do is say, all right, um, you know, they're turning the thermostat up higher. No, no, no. Turn the thermostat all the way down or turn it to off. And once you turn it off, listen. All right. I'm not sure if you heard that click at all. It's re-engaged. Now turn it back on again, and that valve is going to open up. So it's re-engaged. You don't have to. You don't have to take that trip back to the job site and manually open or manually close that valve again. Um, so depending on which way it was, you'll be able to get it up and going with the with the homeowner, and they don't even have to go downstairs to the basement. So that's built into all of the zone sentries. You know, like you get some zone valves that have the hook in there. They get stuck in there and they're not going to come in and they're not going to come out of it. So just something you've got built into them to, to really make it easy. Very good. Very good. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That, again, the, and you did, you, did you show how 
you, you had you showed earlier how easy it is to take the head off of this thing, right? Yes, I did. Yes, while you were talking about it, I was shoving it in the camera. If you there haven't you seen it before, this is that silver tab uh, that John was talking about right on the back side of it here. And you just push that in and you pull it off. And when you look at the underside of it, you'll see that silver tab. The the two holes on the other sides are where the locking posts go in, and then that's where the valve stem goes in. So that's how it just locks in. It's a very, very simple design. No tools needed to take this thing apart. The other really cool thing about this valve, if you happen to install it in this position, meaning the wires over here and your zone box is actually you know, on the opposite side, it's, it's over on this side of the controller. You know, If you end up with your zone controller this way, all right, you don't have to run the wires around the system, you know, go from one side back around, you know, like on this job here, yeah, our zones out here, if you had the wires, they would have come out of here, come down and through. I tucked ours into the, uh, uh, into the top here just to clean it up. Uh, but a lot of guys want to come into the bottom side. Well, you can just go ahead and take that power head off. Again, get it cleared from the locking posts, spin it around, and then lock it back in again. So you've just rotated it so the wires are going in the other direction just to make it a little easier, cleaner install and, and things like that. <clears throat> very good, very good. I uh, had a question from Nick. Uh, thought a boiler circulator was needed, but the last illustration did not use one. Why? Ah, good, good eye there, Nick. That was because we were showing it as a representative of a cast iron boiler. Um, if there was a, if there was, if there was, a, if it was a ModCon boiler, and we had a boiler circulator, a system circulator, and the uh, domestic hot water circulator, the, the 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 indirect circulator, we could still use the same control and run three pumps off of that. We could still do that um, with the exact same control. We simply wire the boiler circulator and the system circulator to the normally closed contacts. Okay, so they're both running at the same, they both run at the same time. Those terminals are good for, are, are, are plenty good to handle handle the load of, of most any circulator, but you'd wire both the boiler circulator and the system circulator to the normally closed contact, so they'll both run at the same time, and when the domestic circulator calls, they'll both close, they'll both stop running at the same time. Okay, so good catch there, Nick. Good eyes. Good eyes. I'm glad you asked that. Very good eyes. All righty, great. Uh, what are the questions you guys have in here, man? Let's uh, let's keep those coming because again, that was. Oh wait, 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 wait. We got to do the trivia, right? Oh, we got to give some stuff away from last week. We gotta, yes. Yeah, you know, we got to give some stuff away from last week. Forget this week. We got to go back to last week. Now we got a lot of we we got a lot of answers here uh for this week and let's uh let's uh, give you guys the right answer here okay and uh, i don't know if you can see am i sharing my i'm not sharing my screen am i here you are not yet. there we go let me share my screen now there you go so the trivia question the trivia answer what was snoopy's plane it was as many of you got guessed the sopwith camel it was the sopwith sopwith camel and he went after the the Red Baron in his uh, was it? He he had a triplane. It was a it was like a Fokker triplane or something like that. I, I I I remember reading about it. I can't remember what it was. But the Red Baron actually was a real dude too. So yep, Snoopy flew the Sopwith Camel back in World War One in his imagination. So uh, we will go. pick the winner of that uh, of that one next week. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and we're going to pick the winner from last week. Now, I got to remember what the question is from last week. Hey, John. Yeah. Does Rick have a sop with camel? Does Rick have a sop with camel? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he, I don't even week. know if he ever smoked camels either. Last week we had uh, was the the School of Rock theme. Can you hear me, Jay? I can hear you. What was our theme? What was our theme last week? Last week's theme was uh, School of Rock, after school specials. Oh, the after school specials. Yes, the after school specials. And what was and what was the function of a conjunction? Right. 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 Yep. Looking up words and clauses and phrases. Right. And and or and but. 
No, not and right. and and but is it and but or or? I got to look it up. I can't remember what that was now. <laughs> so, anyways, I've got all the list of names of everybody that got it right last week. So let me do that. Click on it and spin around and see who's going to be last week's winner. Then I know I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't get to uh, send some stuff out. So let's see here. Justin Burns. Justin. So Justin, I know you're online with us tonight. So if you can, uh, while we're here, send over your e um, your uh, mailing address. I can send out that product to you as quick as possible. So thank you very much, everybody that did uh, put an answer in there and still enjoys hanging out and having fun with us uh, while we just give you random useless trivia sometimes. <laughs> So greatly appreciate it. Oh, Douglas! Douglas knew who the what the Red Baron flow. It was a Fokker DR1 triplane. All right, very good, very good. Curse you, Red Baron! I remember that. Old Snoopy. He was quite a character. I had a I, I had a lot of I used to have a couple of Snoopy banners and posters on my on my bedroom wall when I was a kid. I was a big Charlie Brown fan. I always I always identified with Charlie Brown. No, because I wasn't a very good baseball player either. <laughs> I don't know if I was a blockhead. Maybe I was a blockhead. I don't know. Blockhead, I was a kid. Yeah. Maybe I still am. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Easy there, Linus. <laughs> Mr. Messenbring, Mr. Ward, how you doing? Good, good. Were you able to ever kick a football very well? I could kick a football all right. I didn't. I didn't have a, a neighborhood girl who'd pull it out from in front of me. <laughs> not, 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 not until college, anyway. That's when that started to happen. Uh, but uh, no, no, that's. <laughs> I was. I was. I was okay at kicking a football. I was all right there. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, do well, me a favor, the, guys. One of the questions that came in. Yes, I almost forgot about it, and it happens to be Justin. Uh, so Justin asked about. Oh yes, Justin. I already have your address. That's right. I. I um. Anyways, he was asking about the zone sentry. Does it fail in place? It will always fail to close. So if it's, if it's normally closed, right? If it's opened, remember that it's getting that capacitor charge all the time. As soon as you take the power away, as soon as the power disappears from the valve itself, it says, oh, that means you must want to close now. You're finished with me. And that, dis and that capacitor then discharges. So if you lose power in the neighborhood, you know, the city, whatever, it's still going to end up closing. You're not going to get it in the stuck open position. Very good. Very good. Let me have Justin just gave through in his address uh, there. Excellent. Uh, uh, John and Tim, I guess if, if if there's anybody who doesn't know mechanical, what mechanical hub is and does, you guys want to uh, just get, give us a quick uh, lowdown on, on, on the magic that is mechanical hub. Yeah, it's an online resource for plumbing and mechanical and uh, HVAC guys. It's a website, mechanical uh, hyphen hub, mechanical hub with a hyphen, mechanical hyphen hub.com. And you can go there. It's got tons of information. We have newsletters. We have social media. We just started doing podcasts. So we're, you know, we're kicking butt and we partner with you guys. And we've been doing this since the pretty much the when the pandemic started. Yep. And we're having a great time. So thank you guys for putting this on. We really appreciate it. And I think all the uh, attendees really appreciate it too. So kicking butt, man. And right, hey, we appreciate everybody showing up and giving us something to do on a Wednesday night. So, um, and I guess we talked a little bit about this last week, but I'd like mm -hmm. to hear from you guys again. Uh, are you getting more and more comfortable with the online learning thing? Because everybody in there and everybody and their brothers doing the, doing webinars and, and, uh, you know, as are we. I just want to make sure that you guys are are cool with it, and that we're doing a we're doing what you doing the kind of stuff that you want. And any suggestions you have for stuff that we can do in the future for you, in this online um, in this online arena, you know, we're all ears because there's 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 kind of like a there's kind of like no one's written this book yet for our industry. I mean, yeah, there's people that say, well, I'm an expert in online learning. Yeah, no, you're not. You're just you you've just done it maybe more than other people, and you've figured out what works and what doesn't but but I would like to see what what you guys would like to see more of online um yeah I, I'm with you Zvi on uh, on on in-person training there's nothing better than being in front of a group of people and and and, and feeding off the energy and, and working together for a full day 
uh, to, 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 you know, the stuff we're doing for over the net over 10 weeks, you can do in a day. Right. But again, the stuff we're doing over 10 weeks, we're, we, we will have over 100 people online at a time. So it, there's a trade off. So I, I'm not quite sure, you know, that we're going to do, uh, you know, as, as the world turns, we're going to do both. We're definitely going to do both. But uh, just if there's something that, that you'd like to see online that we have not done yet, what uh, just let me know what that might be. And maybe we'll see if we can pull it off. All right. Yeah, it's need to send me an email, send John an email. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, work that. Even if you don't think of anything right now, please do. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat section in a second. There it is. Yeah, put mine in there too, would you? Nah. Actually, just email John for everything. So. <laughs> uh, let's see. Have you ever tried hooking up a radio zone to a TVA with a remote sensor? A TVA with a remote sensor. Am I missing something there, Mike? A uh, valve actuator. Oh, so, with, oh, okay. With oh, all right, with a remote sensor. Yeah, okay, like one a thermostatic radiator valve with a little capillary tube. Is that what you mean? You know, I've done that. I, I, yeah, I've done that. Did that years and years ago. Actually, one of my very first radiant jobs in the '80s was with Stadler. Because uh, they were local to me in Massachusetts, and they, for their water temperature control, they had a little adjustable thermostatic valve actor, thermostatic radiator valve, with a capillary tube that's strapped onto the pipe, and that's how you set the water temperature, the fixed water temperature for the radiant. You know, instead of using a thermostatic mix valve, you had the TVA with a with the capillary tube that's strapped on the pipe, and that's how you that's that's how you control the water temperature. So yeah, I've 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 done that. Absolutely done that for water temperature control, not necessarily for zone control, but it but I've also installed panel radiators with thermostatic radiator valves that had a capillary sensor to sense the room air temperature someplace that wasn't two and a half inches from the freaking hottest thing in the room. <laughs> okay. Which I never understood how people would say, oh, that's the best way to run a <laughs> run around. Hydraulic no. system is thermostatic radiators, but yeah, it's two two inches from the hottest thing in the room, but maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. Well that's why there was a number on it and not a therm not a temperature scale. Right. Right. You just put a number on it because okay, whatever the number was, if you were cold at that number, turn it up one. So, yeah, but yeah. One's people, not doing it. Let me turn it up to two. Yeah, two's yeah. better. Maybe three. We'll try three. And you guess yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, as as Rich McGrath says, it's also where the coldest air is, right? Because we are still getting that natural convection to our current right. place, right? So, right. On, you know, actually, it's usually yeah. So um, coldest air right next to the hottest yeah. thing. I don't know how. Well, it, it must work. You know, it, 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 sure, it does work. But you don't. The, the setting it is kind of a. Of an ex of an exercise in learning on the fly, so to now, speak. Now I do remember years ago, and this is this is jumping back about 20 years ago. I remember Oventrop had a radiant controller with a TVA, but it was mounted like thermostat height, so you had to pipe your your tube up to it in the wall. It was a box that went in the wall itself, and it just had the dial sticking out, and you ran your zone coming up to it and then back down. Um, I think they also tried to design it, you know, to go with panel rads, remotely locate the controller, so to speak. Then it still had that, uh, still had that capillary tube that was working mm. with it too. It was pretty, it was a, it was a neat install, but I'm like, it's not going to work here. You know? Yeah. So I remember, I think somebody knocked on the door and said, oh, you guys should start designing around these. And yeah, I didn't go there. No, so no. yeah, it no, just, like, it was cool, different. but yeah. Did we did we talk about the the Eberly thermostats in this series already the the original thermostats that all the radiant companies came and sold when they came over from Europe you know Wurzbo sold it Stadler sold it everybody anybody who started from a European origin sold the Eberly thermostat and you remember it was kind of it was square with rounded corners and it had a little dial in the right hand corner with a line and the line pointed to a dot on the thermostat and then a a red line to indicate hotter and a blue line to indicate colder, and you just adjust it. And that people hated it because there was no there was no numbers on the damn thing, and nobody could tell if they were comfortable or not, which I never understood either. You know, I said, well, I have to see the numbers to know if I'm comfortable. And I, I don't know what are you doing? You're outside. I don't know. Um, so people hated the things. They were great thermostats, super accurate, man. 
very, very reliable, excellent thermostat for the money, but people hated him because he didn't have numbers. So then they tried to put numbers on them to show what you said it to, what you've said it to. But people didn't like that a whole lot better because it didn't tell them what the temperature was. Yeah, you know, I know what you I know what I've said it to, but I know what the temperature is. So we'd see a lot of them with a little stick-on thermometer right next to the thermostat, so people could actually tell if they were comfortable or not in the room. Which I always thought, put your hand over it and see if they're cold. How, how, how do you feel? How do you feel now? Okay, now you can't see the thermostat. Uh, I, I, customer service was not my strong point back then. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the uh, comments coming in uh, from Doug was asking if we can uh, maybe do a class on the hydro air controls and maybe hydro air sometime. So yeah, I'm going to look into that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, that we'd probably be, yeah, we could most, yep. Yeah, like I said, hydro air control, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, another question came in from Justin. Do we have anything like the 3450, the the feedback flow combo for commercial applications? Mm. Well, the, the 3450 is up to 50 PSI. So if you're looking for a higher pressure for a system, uh, the 3450 can be adjusted up to 50 PSI if that helps at all. Um, but if you're looking for something that's going to have like an RPZ double backflow, stuff like that. Yeah. Not in the, not in the 3450. Yeah. I don't think we get into too many other accessories like that on the commercial side. Yeah, he did throw in with a testable RPZ. So yeah, no, no, that's not that's not in our in our. I don't we don't have those in our commercial catalog, unfortunately. Good, great questions, guys. Excellent, excellent. And for those of you who just chime in, thank you for the kind words. We do appreciate it. I'm glad I'm glad we're doing what we're doing the right stuff by you because that's uh, again that's what we talk about this all the time what's going to be the right thing for us to do or the best thing for us to do and how do we make these things worthwhile so i'm glad you're liking the night school i'm really glad you're liking the night school because otherwise yeah you can't go right because we got to be out there working yep so yeah and i'm glad you guys come and hang out with us too at the same time because i know you worked hard all day long and getting the heat back on and fixing people's systems out there and doing the installs so that's always a good thing and you know i know when we do a lot of classes during the day everybody has good intentions of showing up they'll sign up for a class and you know i'll show up to to wherever i'm doing that class and you know talk to whoever's organizing oh yeah we got 30 people that signed up and you end up getting 10. well yeah. it also just so happened it got to be a cold night last night and you know, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of homeowners called and you, you as a contractor, you sit there saying, mm -hmm. all right, do I get the heat back on for these customers? They've been with me for 20 years or do I go and listen to some guy, you know, yak on for a couple hours. So, um, so I hear you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us tonight. And you worked hard today too. So yeah. I've been sitting behind the desk most of the day today. So <laughs> um, I do commend you guys getting out there, you know, going into people's homes. You remember, still be safe. You know, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm just, I don't know if it's the news just trying to scare the hell out of me or whatever, but, you know, when you start hearing across the country, things are going up again. Um, mm -hmm. That's because we're all opening back up again. We're kind of acting normal, you know, and going out. I mean, I drove past a couple of restaurants the other day and jammed, jammed. So, and I, and I get it. I get it. I, you know, so, um, so just with you guys going into people's homes, just be careful. Just be yep. careful. And thank you for doing it too. Yeah, absolutely. Be safe and be safe. Be careful. And so we, so we can keep doing this. All right. Yeah. Uh, so do you guys still have the book with the wiring diagrams? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we don't have it in the handout section, do we? And no, we can't we add not. it. To, we, can I we can't add it to the handout? No, can't add it while we're running. Well, you can't add it. Let me see if I can do it. No, I don't think you can. No, you can't. No, I no. can't. No, bummer. Yeah. So, but if you need it right now, Terry, while you're online, get to the Takeo website, click on products, then jump down to controls and pick any one of them. Doesn't matter which control it is, um, because and then you'll look for uh, literature, and you just scroll down the list because it's going to give you the instructions for each control or whatever one you pick on. But then at the bottom, it's going to say complete wiring guide, and you have hey, that. It's down. letting me. It's letting me upload it. It's letting you upload. Yeah. Look at, look at that. I look at that. Yeah. Hey, don't do anything Dave just said. Go to the handout <laughs> section. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just ignore Dave. Up. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm your friend. Go to the yeah. handout section 
and you should I, see I, a wiring guide PDF right there. Download it from there. I see. Right? I don't. So, don't right. listen to Dave. Don't listen to Dave. <laughs> he doesn't give me full control now. Uh, however, <laughs> if you need a hard copy, because I know everybody likes to have the hard copy, at least two on the truck. Keep one on the dashboard and keep one with the control section. Um, find your local rep. We got tons of them. So find your local guy. Um, we'll, we'll get it out to you. Yep, very good. Yeah, we got our reps have them. We have them available as well. And it's a it's a great great resource. Why does the website require a computer degree to navigate now? Because we made it easier, Dave. Uh, Rich, we made it easier. <laughs> Anytime there's a change, I I I I hate changes in websites. I hate them because as bad as the old one was, you were used to it. You knew where to find stuff, right? Yeah. Every you 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 had it down. It may have driven you crazy for a long time, and it may make no sense whatsoever. But once you know where to go, where to find what you're looking for, you know where to find what you're looking for. Then they switch it to make it easier, and you got to learn it all over again. It's just the way I, it is. It is. It is. I have found it a little easier now. I can. I, or you know what? It is just getting used to it. So I find yeah. what I need to now quickly. I know where it is. Um, I've been messing with it for a while now, so we're. we're I'm cool with it. You know, yeah. it's just like whenever I wanted to learn a new heat loss software. For those of you that do your own designs, there's only one way to learn a new software. You have to delete the old one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you'll jump back to it every single time. Every time yep. you get a new software that's replacing something that you've got already, you got to delete the old one. Otherwise, you're just going to say, oh, no, this was easier back that way. You know, no, just delete it. And and muscle through it and you'll and you'll figure it out. So yep. Yep. I, I love how easy all this tech has made our lives. Imagine if Paul Revere would have had Twitter <laughs> and been and, blocked. <laughs> <laughs> the red coats are coming. Oh no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can hear me. Just my friends can. Darn it. Yep, 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 yep. How many Instagram users do we have out there? I'd be interested to hear from you guys. The 60, about 60 of you left out there. How many guys use Instagram? Oh, there we go. Carl Carboni, you do? Yep, great. Okay, very good. Do you use it for just for, you know, for uh, for personal stuff or do you use it for business as well? Or, or a mixture of both? Yep. Already following Dave. Yep. You, I got, I have two Instagram accounts. You can follow either one of mine. Yeah. For high school classes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, it's becoming, it's becoming a place for, uh, I guess companies like us to, to kind of try and reach out and give you guys information as well. So we're trying to do some, we're trying to do some stuff like that to see, uh, what, uh, if, if that might be helpful to you, if we can put videos and stuff on there, if you, if, uh, if those things, if you think you might find those helpful, let us know. And if there's anything you think we might want to put on there, let us know as well. Um, you know, how, like, like how to use the 3450 uh, dual valve or how, you know, walk through what Jay, what Dave just walked through on the, uh, on the zone valve operation. Very, very great, very simple, very easy to do little videos for our part that can, that'll be on Instagram forever, you know? So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. So, yeah, nice to mention the public app education. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Phil, you don't use Facebook. Yeah, Facebook's weird. Facebook's gone on taking. If, if, somebody, what was it? Somebody wants to. Yeah, it's Facebook's for old people now. <laughs> Facebook's Facebook, for old Facebook people. Facebook is for the Instagram parents. Yes, there you go. There you go. Right. We, we started right. On, on on Facebook and, and we still continue with it. And the kids were like, I'm not going there because my parents hang out there. You know? <laughs> right. so my, my kids have it and don't have Facebook at all. They're on Instagram. So, um, yeah, I use it. My daughter does. You know, and, and they're not even stuck. My daughter doesn't even like to use fa uh, Instagram any longer. She won't post anything. She looks at it all day long, but she won't post a thing. You know, maybe twice a year she'll put something up there, you know, so. Um, but it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I remember when I first started at Takeo and hanging out with Mark Chaffee one day and, you know, I see some people that, you know, so a lot of people will get, you know, against some of the social media and all this other stuff, stay away from it, not going to touch it. Um, but Mark Chaffee said this thing to me one day, 
and, and imagine us as as a manufacturer or a reps or any of the sales guys that are here with us and imagine you want to go see a contractor and you get in your car monday morning you drive to that contractor shop at nine o'clock you knock on the door because you want to talk to him you want to you know talk about some product that you got or whatever make his life easier and he doesn't answer the door tuesday you said all right well nine o'clock was probably too late he already went out to the job site let me go at eight o'clock you get there at eight o'clock and there's no answer on the door do you go back wednesday at 7 a.m <laughs> probably not what are you gonna do you're gonna call them right so you're so my point is when you said, well, I want to go see him face to face, that was your way of communicating with him. Contractors like, I'm too busy. The only way you can communicate with me is by picking up the phone. If he doesn't answer the phone, you send him a text. If he doesn't answer the text, you send an email, All right? You send an Instagram. So my point is also, we have a lot of customers out there, a lot of our homeowners that prefer a certain way for communicating. So we don't get to choose how we communicate with our customers any longer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know I like to text some people and some people I'd rather pick up the phone. So some I'm going to send an email because they need to see the step by steps out of it. So there's a lot of different ways that we all get to communicate. So just remember that with your customers, too. They want to communicate with you how they want to communicate. So right. you might be missing out on a whole demographic in your town because you you don't have an Instagram or you don't have a Facebook or or something like that. So um and and I know on either one of those accounts, if you start getting posts up there, you can get an email saying that you're getting it. So at least you're still monitoring emails, things like that. So right. Yeah. It's it's the it's just it's another new way of communicating. And uh how however you, who he who uses it the best is gonna have a huge advantage, I think, uh, in any in any respect. It takes time. Uh, there's a take time. Yeah. There's a question from Russell. Uh, those brass things below the zone sentries, what are they and what are they used for? Oh. Like you, you touched, you, you referenced those uh, very briefly, Dave. Maybe just uh, did go over those again. They're, they're circuit setters. Yep. It's a circuit, it's a balancing valve. So I'll pull the camera in a little closer again uh, so you can see them. So it's a flow meter here. All right. So there's a little float that's in here that's going and some graduations on the glass that's going to tell you what the flow is and then there's a balancing valve <laughs> approximately yeah it's not a digital readout it's just giving you a grade <laughs> uh, underneath there now mine's a little tough to read because i had this in a system you know and this was sitting around for a while before i cleaned it and, and put, took it apart but i didn't take these apart to clean the glass so um so we have these at Taco uh, also in different sizes uh different flow meter i think we have one that reads from one to four and another one that goes from three to 12 gallons a minute uh, as an inline flow, very low CV on them. I don't remember what the CV is, or very high CV, low pressure drop. And then we have another style um, that is an instant read, which means it's just a brass body right here. And then off the side is a bypass with the flow meter and a handle. So when you squeeze the handle, the water bypasses through it. So you get the reading and then it goes back out. You let go the water goes straight through the middle and you don't end up with what I have now, dirty glass. So it depends on what you're really looking for. Um, you know, commercial style systems or adjustments are happening. You want to get that instant read. You grab that one that has the sides uh, on there. You have something like this. This is typically set it and forget it. You got to set up for your system. So you know what the flow is going to be going out to your systems themselves if you wanted to balance them. Yeah, I'd be interested again hearing from you guys. How many have have you ever have you ever used circuit setters or flow flow balancing type valves on like a zone valve system or in a zone pump system? Again, my experience has been very very rare. Uh, and to me, the, the 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 valves on a radiant manifold don't count because those aren't really what you call circuit setters. Those are those are flow balancers. Those are those are those are there to balance the flow so that all of the loops have the same amount of flow. So I'd, I'd like the uh, I'd like I'd, I'd like to hear from what you guys what you guys think think of those like it's like hitting the gas and the brakes at the same time yeah kind of like that yeah so I got I, I I you just don't see them residentially very much because it's 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 an extra it's an extra amount of work that maybe the val and cost and maybe the value is kind of marginal I don't know that's my thoughts but uh, you're, you're the guys that count here so I'd be interested yeah. to hear what you guys say. 
I've always considered the balancing valve as the thermostat. That's that does a good job of balancing. I, in my opinion, I'm done. Turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Richard says commercial spec jobs only. Yep. That's pretty much where they go. Yeah. If they're spec commercially. Yeah. I agree with you, Richard. And nowadays, when you get in these things, you know the the ECM style, and and especially ours, the uh, the 18, where you can actually dial it in for what you want it to do, then then it becomes uh, less of an issue. Yeah, point. much less yeah. of a need. Yeah. Now the both now the combination of circulator and and thermostat actually do a hell of a good job because now we can we can make we can dial that circulator into the exact flow that we need. Like two gallons per minute at two feet ahead. We can do that with the 0018 valves. We can do that. All righty. Well, hey, let's take a take a last go round for, for questions, guys. Uh, it's about, what time is it here? We got about, uh, about 835. So another hour and a half session. Not a lot of fun, a lot of fun hanging out with y'all. I really do appreciate yeah. it. I got to show you this. So Bira oh. was uh, drinking tonight. All right, it's called the robots. Save the Robot. Yeah, but this <laughs> that's not what caught my eye. This is what caught my eye is the is the brewer. The Radiant Pig. <laughs> Radiant Pig Craft Beers. And I remember you talk about that. You've said that terminology when we start talking heat loss. Right. right? And efficient and not efficiency, but you say um, you know, boil is a pig. Yeah. Right. And, and I saw that on the on the can. Yeah, I saw that on the can the other day. I'm like, I got to buy it just for that. I got to show John the Radiant Pig. The Radiant Pig. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yes. Low fat, high fiber diet. That's right, Richard. <laughs> uh, that was, yeah, we had, we, uh, we actually, we had that in our Takeo Tuesday earlier this month, um, which uh, you should be able to watch it online if you, if uh, on our, on our website, if you haven't yet. It was about how to estimate fuel consumption. Uh, in a in a hydronic system, you know, in a residential system, for those customers that are going to ask you, well, what's my payback? And I tell you, and, or when's this thing going to pay for itself? And I, I tell people, it never, it doesn't work that way. You know, the system's never going to pay for itself, and it's never going to pay you back unless it gets a part-time freaking job. You know, it just that, that, those are those are those are silly questions that they think they have to ask, but there's really they're asking the wrong question. You know, the boiler is in a slot machine and it's not going to come up triple cherries and you're not going to get you know money spewing out of the relief valve. The, as Dave said, the, the, the boiler is a pig, all right? It eats fuel and it poops heat and that's it, all right? Your job is to put it on a high fiber, low fat diet. That's all. It's a consumer. It is an appliance like it's an appliance, just like the refrigerator, just like the stove, just like the microwave. It's no different. So that's the that's the conversation, and it's an uncomfortable one to have for a guy who's insisting on finding out his payback on his new boiler. It's, no, I would get a paper route then, pal. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, Salt Lake City has the polygamy brewery. <laughs> oh, why would you need? Why would why would you need more than one? I don't understand that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Don't get it. Beers? No, no, not beers. <laughs> Yeah, why would you need more than one beer? I understand, right? And and that might is I wonder if that's where Mayo is. Yeah, and Mayo's not he's not a he's not a polygamist to the best of my knowledge. He's not a polygamist. Of course, we don't know where he is tonight, so <laughs> we'll, we'll reserve judgment on the Lorax on that one. Uh, all right, folks. Hey, listen. Thank you again. I appreciate the gift of your time as always, and. Uh, uh, it's always a joy spending Wednesday nights with you, and I, I hope we keep. We, well, let's just keep this going. We'll just keep this going as long as we can, and as long as uh, as long as you guys want to listen to us, we'll keep yapping away. So uh, we'll see you next week. When Dave? Same bad time. Same, same bad, bad channel. channel. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks Enjoy a lot. Enjoy all. Thank you. See you, guys. See you John. Bye.